This, as Brother has suggested, will be our last service with you in this camp. We would like to express our appreciation to the leaders, Brother Van Warmer, Brother Robertson. I feel that the Lord would have us give you for our last uh, our last Bible study more of a, an exposition, if such you want to call it, of a passage. I think the Lord wants us to leave what we have said as it is. Though there are many, many things we'd like to say in the area, we feel that maybe we've come to a place where we can leave it as it is. And for the morning, I'd like to turn to the fifth chapter of Second Kings. If you have your Bibles and want to follow me, it, uh, it's going to be one thing to be blessed of God and testifying in meetings such as we've had what God has done and how he is working and how blessed he is to you and what it means but there are other situations under which you may be called upon to witness and so in this lesson this morning there are three characters at least that I should like us to take note of beginning at verse 1 of 2nd Kings chapter 5 it has to do with Naaman the leper and his healing Elisha the prophet and an unnamed person one whose name we do not know but in the first verse of this uh, chapter and I'll speak of it as I go along now Naaman captain of the host of the king of Syria was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance to Syria he was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. As I look over the things that are said about this man, I think uh, what a man he must have been. A great man with his master, that is the king. He was captain of the host of Syria, and that wouldn't mean the same thing as captain in the American army. Or a captain in the American army should be the commander of a company of soldiers. While I've seen a great many second lieutenant's company commander, yet uh, uh, that may be cheaper to have them because they don't get as much pay as the first lieutenant or a captain. But uh, uh, supposedly, theoretically, the captain, a man who is commander of a company should be a captain. But here the word captain would compare with our commander-in-chief or our commanding general. Here's a man that is in command of the hosts of Syria. Now, it is said of him that he was an honorable man. And whenever God can put that in his book about any man, it's something to be desired. I have met men whom, who were good military men, but... I couldn't say they were honorable. I think of the old uh, camp commandant uh, whom they wrote up in the newspaper out in the little, in the city. They re referred to him as the grand old man with the genial smile. But I'd seen him on the drill field when if they could have seen him as I saw him, they wouldn't have said that. He was anything but that. Just a roughneck hard-boiled cursing man but here it is said of this man he was honorable and I say that's a worthy title for a man to be able to say of you for God and actually this isn't just one man saying it it's in the word of God that he was an honorable man whenever God has it in his word that a man is honorable that's something to be desired an honorable man. Then it declares that he was a mighty man in valor. Now that would suggest to me that he was, he was a man of courage. Now courage
courage is not the absence of fear. A man may not have any fear because he doesn't have any sense. He may have no sense of the danger he's in and he may be very casual and nonchalant and yet unaware of the fact that he's right on the rim of death. That isn't courage. In my judgment, courage is the ability to do your duty in the face of known danger. When I know what the danger is and then have courage enough or have that ability to control my emotions and do my duty, no matter what the danger is, that's courage in my book. A man or a woman that dares to do right, no matter what the issues are, dares to do right. And then the statement, but he was a leper. I have seen pictures of lepers, and I'd read about leprosy, and I'd heard men preach on it as a type of sin and all of that. But I made a little trip through Africa, or parts of Africa, a few years back. And on one of the mission fields, the missionary said, I want to take you over to visit a leper. In that particular village, the, the natives had a, a kind of a tribal honor, code of honor. They didn't want to turn their older people over to a colony, a leper colony. They preferred to take care of them right there in the village. Uh, and there's a sense in which you could respect those uh, black people for that particular code of ethics or code of conduct. But uh, he said to me, it's a case of burned out leprosy. That is, it's no longer contagious. We went over and as we came to that little uh, mud and wattle thatch roofed hut with a bamboo slat curtain hanging down for the door and the man, the missionary, kind of pulled uh, the curtain back a little, lifted it up and spoke into the darkness of that hut. And I heard a noise uh, and after a bit, here came a man dragging himself over to the door. He was uh, on a dirt floor, and the noise I heard was him moving toward the floor, just kind of dragging himself over. And when he looked up at the missionary, and then he looked at me, I saw something that I had never seen before, the marks of leprosy upon a man's face. He didn't have any nose at all. Leprosy had eaten his nose completely away. All there were was two big holes in his face where his nose had been. Now you may not be satisfied with the nose nature gave you. Maybe too long or too short or too stubby or what. But it's better than none. I tell you that, it's better than none. For it isn't nice to look at the face of a man that has no nose. That isn't nice to look at. But as he looked at me questioningly, the missionary told him who I was. I had come from America. I would come over uh, to preach to them, and he brought me over to see him. And uh, I said to him through the interpreter, the missionary, uh, Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? And the missionary translated, and he, his face lit up a little bit, and he said to the missionary, yes. And the missionary said to me, yes. Then I said to him, then you are my brother. Missionary translated, then you are my brother. And that fellow lifted, and I saw then he didn't have any hands. He just had two stubs. Leprosy had eaten his hands off, just two stumps. He lifted them, and he beat them together as he looked at me, and a radiance came over his face that you can't describe only as you know the Lord. And I said, from that moment, this passage took on new meaning. Here's a man, had everything the world could give him by way of honor, position, and everything he could desire, but he had something else that he didn't want. But he was a leper. 
And sooner or later, a leprosy was going to do to him something of what it had done to this man in that hut. Sooner or later, it was just a matter of time waiting to see what it would eat off, what would drop first. I didn't get to look at the man's limbs. I saw his legs. I saw his arms. I saw his face. I saw the marks of leprosy. I know he couldn't walk for he'd slid across the floor because leprosy had done its work on him. Now we leave that with this man here. And I read again. The Assyrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And I would submit to you that deep, dark, stark tragedy is in that verse. We read it casually, but I wonder if we think about it. And one of the principles of biblical interpretation is to transfer yourself back to the time and circumstances about which you're reading. I've often went back and wondered, did that band of roving, roving Syrians crowding in the uh, edge of, the, uh, of Israel, did they murder this little girl's father and mother and carry her away captive? If they did, that was tragedy. Did they find her at play? Did they just pick her up and kidnap her? If they did, that was tragedy. I don't care how you look at this verse. There's deep, dark, stark tragedy in it. For here's a little girl picked up, parents murdered, we don't know, she's unnamed, we don't know her family, we know nothing about her except what these two verses tell us. She was taken away captive to the land of Syria and was put in the home uh, as a slave girl in the home of the very man whose soldiers had done the deed. Now, if we'll just take a look at that, sit down and think that over a while, what that would mean for any little girl. If I have any young people here this morning, presume they may be over in young people's, but if I have any young people, what would it mean to you if as a little girl you were taken under these same conditions? How would you feel? Well, they were men and women of like passions as we are. They would have the same feelings. There would be the same, uh, same desires uh, in their hearts that would be in your heart. Heathen people love their babies just like American people love their babies. And there's something about motherhood and appreciation of being a mother that I'm not sure may be even greater than in American womanhood. For we're in a day when many, many children are unwelcome in homes. But I rode one day 125 miles or so with a woman in the back end of the pickup. Missionary and I were in the front and a group of natives in the rear. I stood at the hospital when the doctor had addressed her and told her that he was sorry that they couldn't save her baby. But he said, next time, don't wait so long. You come right away next time. And I saw that woman stand there, as stoical as a post, and never make any kind of manifestation. She <clears throat> listened to what that doctor said, what had happened. Well, they, she'd gone to the witch doctor and to everybody else that she could before she turned to the white man, and when they'd exhausted everything they could do, then she turned to him, but too late, and he couldn't save the baby. She rode 125 miles. We stopped in a little mud and wattle, thatch roof houses, a village of that kind. She got out and took her little, uh, little bag with what she had, walked over to a uh, a little gateway crossed a, a, a kind of a dry ditch and into the yard where a hut and an elderly woman came out. And I suppose it was her mother asking her something in native 
And not until she met that mother did she ever show any manifestation of sorrow. When she met that mother, she just threw her hands in the air and wailed, not screamed, wailed, and pushed by and ran into the house and apparently threw herself on the ground and the last we heard as we pulled out of town was the wailing of that woman because she'd lost her baby. <clears throat> they, they feel just like you feel. And young people, those young people would feel like you feel. But here's a little girl, captured, taken away, made a slave, serving the man whose soldiers either killed her parents or kidnapped her. No. If any girl, if there ever was any justifiable reason in the world for anyone to have bitterness in their heart, this little girl was just would have been justified. Huh? If there ever was any such thing as a justifiable reason for bitterness, this little girl would have had it. Why, she could have been homesick. She could have been many, many things. I've seen girls, bigger girls than little girls, and I do not know how big she may have been, only she's a little maid. I've seen bigger girls come to Bible school. And they aren't there a week until they're crying and sobbing and just can't stay away from mom, pa, got to go home. She may have been homesick too. I'd like to leave with you the idea that there's tragedy, deep tragedy here. <clears throat> and every occasion that you could ask for for bitterness, but I'd like you to notice what she actually had. Next verse. She said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Now that's all we know about this little girl, how she got over there and what her testimony was. Two verses, she disappears. We don't know her name, we don't know her family, but by the grace of God, I want to find out one day who she was. I must confess to you, I've been curious uh, for a good long time to know who this little girl was. Instead of bitterness and ugliness, when she saw that uh, man walking around with leprosy, instead of taking an attitude, it's good enough for you. I'm glad you have it. I hope it eats your nose off. I, I hope you lose your feet. I hope you lose your hands. She didn't take that attitude. She had something else. I've heard people say, well, they, they didn't have any grace back there. Well, they had something. <laughs> I would submit to you that in the 33rd chapter of Exodus, Moses was ordered to take the children of Israel, lead them on. He, he remonstrated. He said, Lord, I, I can't lead them. And the Lord said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And Moses said, if thy presence go not with us, lead us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known that I and thy people have received grace in thy found grace in thy sight shall it not be in that thou goest with us so shall we be separated I and thy people from all people upon the face of the earth there's something about grace that will separate you from other people who don't have grace <laughs> but anyway the little <clears throat> little girl had testified. She didn't have any bitterness. She said, I would, notice how she puts it, would God, I would God that my Lord were over there in Samaria, for there is a prophet would heal him. 
Now, <clears throat> World War I, we didn't have all the means of intercommunication that they had in World War II. Of course, they had the signal corps, but every soldier had to learn the semaphore and the wigwag system and the Morse code because they used semaphore and wigwag when they couldn't get the lines through to have communication by telegraph or telephone. <coughs> but uh, we learned this through experimentation that you couldn't depend upon oral transmission. They started a ten-word message down a line of 50 men. And it gained approximately a word per man. And at the end, it was so garbled, you couldn't recognize what you started with. We didn't try the women, but we did try the men. I don't know whether women could have done any better. It has taught me this, that you cannot repeat exactly what you hear exactly as you heard it. You can't do that. You listen, you get an impression. But what you've heard came out of a personality, passes through a personality, and goes to a third personality. And I tell the impression I receive. So that the rules of war were that no order was ever to be obeyed unless it was in writing or had come direct through communication, never through oral transmission because it was undependable. Now, I don't know who got this message garbled. I do not know how many, how many mouths it may have passed through. Verse 4 says, One went and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus, said the maid that is of the land of Israel. The king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I'll send a letter unto the king of Israel. Now the little maid hadn't said one word about the king of Israel. I don't suppose the king of Israel ever knew that there had been a little maid like this captured. I don't suppose he'd ever heard about that tragedy out somewhere on the, on the edges of his kingdom. I don't suppose. She at least never mentioned the king. She said, there's a prophet over there. King said, I'll send you to the king, and I'll send a letter. And he did that. And will you note that he took a fortune along with him? You look over what he carried along. In verse 5, 6, he took 10 talents of silver, 6,000, the word pieces is supplied, 6,000, of gold and ten changes of raiment. And that's really a fortune. And I can almost picture him as he brought the letter to the king of Israel, pulled up in front of that ivory palace that Ahab had built, and sends that letter in to Jehoram, who was king, and waits for an answer. And old Jehoram gets it, and he tears his garment from top to bottom. And he said, look, see what this king of Syria is, how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me? Who does he think I am? Does he think I'm God that I can kill and make alive? He wants me to heal this fellow of his leprosy. <clears throat> well, it really got them excited around the palace somewhere old Elisha heard about it, that the king had torn his garment. And Elisha did what I'd want to pray quite a while before I did. Now you preachers, how'd you like to be in his boots and send up to the king and say, you send him down here. He'll find out there's a prophet in Israel. Would you want the king to ship a leper down to your place to heal him? Heal him? Would you want to send the message? I don't know whether you brethren as ministers have ever felt yourself endowed with authority from God to do something. 
One time, I, in the matter of healing, I felt that. I walked into a home, and to the glory of God, no credit to me. I'm just mud, same as everybody else. But because of some challenge that had been issued, and I had prayed a great deal about it, I went to this place after service one night, and two or three blocks before we arrived, Salvation Army captain, for I was holding a meeting in the Salvation Army Hall. I had a strange sense of divine authority settle upon me. That I was authorized by God to go into that home and order the devil to release that woman. I can't tell you unless you've had some sense of that, what that's like. If I hadn't had something like that, I'd be utterly lost with this. Elisha said, send him down. And now, maybe a little later, I'll tell you what I think had happened. But Elisha sent, and I imagine the king was very, very glad to get rid of that fellow. He, I could imagine him telling old Naaman with a good deal of relief. Uh, the prophet wants to see you just over the hill. And I don't think he lived in an ivory house. I think he must have lived in a humble abode. And when that, pro when that commander in chief pulled up with his retinue of followers and stopped in front and sent the message in, uh, Naaman, the captain of the host of the king of Syria, is out here. He wants to talk to you. And I try to visualize that fellow in all of his military paraphernalia. I tell you, they can really deck themselves out. Even in this country, you see them with all their decorations on, and it's really something. And the Oriental, the Oriental didn't need any encouragement. He knew how to do it, too. And I can picture old Naaman pulling up there with all of that. And the old prophet never even stuck his head out the door. He simply sent a messenger to him, and he said, you tell him to go jump in the river. And if you jump in seven times, he'll be all right. Well, I tell you, that really punctured the pride of the fellow. You read the record there. He didn't like that. He, and and in the, there was a special river he was to jump in, Jordan. Go dip in Jordan. And this fellow said, if that's jumping in the river as they settle, why, he said, abandon far par a lot better than that old muddy Jordan. I'll go back and do it there. But if God said Jordan, it's Jordan. And there are no substitutions. Sometimes, you know, you read little notices up in the restaurant wall, no substitutions. You may read it on the menu, no substitutions. If God said Jordan, it was Jordan. Well, anyway, he said, I thought he'd come out and put his hand on me and make a certain amount of hocus-pocus and the leprosy would disappear. Well, I've met a lot of people that thought it would be like this or that or the other. But I never did see anybody get salvation like they thought they would. Huh? Never. I've seen a lot of people seeking and finding, but I never did see anybody get like they thought they would. I've seen them the very opposite. I saw a man who wanted to be a shouting Methodist. He'd seen some shouting Methodists somewhere. He had it in his head that if he ever got religion, that's the kind he wanted. And he was on one end of the altar, but he was so busy looking at himself and his life and his record. And apparently he was so glad when God just said, it's all forgiven, I can see him yet. He settled back on his heels with his face up just kind of wiped his mouth, and he said he, he shut the book. He made a motion. Kind of, he said he shut the book. I kind of drew the conclusion the fellow had been kneeling there looking at a record, and when God just shut the book uh, and closed it up, he was so satisfied that he didn't think anything about yelling. But over on the other end of the altar was his little uh, wife, black-eyed, timid, backward, she didn't want that kind of religion that you had to make a lot of noise about. But brother, when she touched the Lord, she forgot all about that. She jumped to her feet and she whirled around and looked at that crowd. 
She had her hands stuck out and her fingers all spraddled out, and she was yelling at them like a Comanche Indian, it's running right off my fingers, it's, it's running right off my fingers. Well, neither of them got it the way they wanted it. And this man didn't get what he wanted to get, but he got what he needed, his pride punctured. And the Bible has it, he went away in a rage. Well now, when some men get in a rage, it's, it's safer to stay away a little while until they cool down. I don't know how far this fellow went uh, feeling like that until one servant got up close to him and addressed him. And notice how he addressed him. Father, verse 13, Father, my father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? If he'd have told you to go back to Syria and get the armies of Syria and go down and besiege Jerusalem, wouldn't you have done that? And I vow he would have. I'll guarantee you that he'd have gone back and gathered the armies of Syria and gone down and tried to capture Jerusalem if that would have been the answer to his need. And we're pretty much like that. There's something we could do. Well, the issue is settled when we get to the place that there is, we see there isn't anything we can do but trust God. And when we come to that point that we're at the end of ourself and we're in the hands of God, something can happen. Now, he listened, and here's evidence that he was a man of some intelligence, for he weighed that statement, and the record in verse 14 is so simple, and yet it is so tremendous. I've read that one verse, and I've said, what would a newspaper reporter from one of the Pittsburgh papers have in their paper if he'd have been there to witness what went on? I try to follow that crowd down to Jordan. I don't know how, where they were, how far they had to go to get there. But I can see that crowd standing on the bank of Jordan, watching their commander-in-chief as he get, rids himself of a lot of the tra trash he has on him, stuff that would sink him. He'd go in with all the stuff he had hanging on, he might never come up. And he gets rid of a lot of that stuff and goes out there. And I can see them standing on the bank watching him and, and as he goes out he goes down once and they're watching to see if there's any evidence of change not a sign of change he goes down twice still not a sign of change could you imagine the tension that's building up on the bank as they watch him go down and up and down and up and down and up six times and not a sign well, if God said seven, six won't do it. And then the simple statement, which is like the Bible, it to me is one of the strong evidences of divine inspiration. There isn't any playing up of this incident. He went down seven times and he came up and his flesh came again as the flesh of a little child and that's it. Brother, what would a newspaper reporter have done with that day's proceedings? Why, your whole front page and the second page and the third, that would have been the big item of the day, wouldn't it? God in one verse tells you what happened. He went down, he dipped seven times, he was healed, he came back. But I tell you, it made a change in him. For now you note, <clears throat> he returned to the man of God, he and all his company. Here they are, the whole crowd that was on the bank. They all come back. And he said, evidently Elisha came out to talk with him now. And he said, Now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Therefore I pray thee take a blessing of thy servant. Elisha said, We aren't taking any offering today. He urged him. No, Elisha said, we aren't taking an offering this service. 
He wasn't giving that Syrian man one inch of ground to stand on to think that he purchased it by any means or amount of money. It was the free gift of God Almighty to a needy soul. We're not taking any offering. Then <clears throat> Naaman became the beggar. He said, will you, will you give me a couple of mules' burdens of earth? Just common dirt. I'd like a couple of mules' burdens of dirt, just common dirt. What's he going to do? Well, he's already said, I know there's no God anywhere but in Israel. Now, he said, for henceforth, I'll never make any sacrifice or offering to any God but the Lord. I'm never going to worship or make any sacrifice. I want a couple of mules' burdens of, of Israelitish dirt. Uh, apparently, I, he wants to make a little altar somewhere in his home or near it where he can come out to worship Jehovah on Israelitish dirt, the God of Israel. Well, the old prophet said, help yourself. A couple of mules' burdens of dirt, that's easy. But then the man <clears throat> said, will you pardon me in this matter? And he tells him what the conditions are going to be. He said, I'm going back over there. And my master, the king, <clears throat> will go into the house of Rimmon, his god. And I'll be his bodyguard. He'll be leaning on my hands. I'll have to go in with him. And I'll have to bow down with him in the house of Rimmon. He said, would you pardon me in this? And the old prophet said, go along. You made your covenant with God. You'd never worship. You'd never sacrifice. You made your covenant. And to me, that little, that last thing settles a lot of questions that I ran into on the foreign field. People that are in situations they didn't get themselves into. They were gotten into it by circumstances over which they have no control. Here's an old, here's a Christian woman living with an old heathen man as the second, third, fourth polygamous wife. She comes to the mission station dressed like a Christian, joins in worship, happy and glad. But when the service is over, she has to go back to that old crowd and live there with a uh, with a heathen man as a polygamous wife. The law's on his side. Everything's on his side. If the missionary were to say, don't you do it, he could come to the station and get her. She had hair enough. He could drag her back by the hair of the head. He could beat her all the way. He could kill her. She's his chattel. She has no choice in this matter. She didn't get herself in it. She gotten into it by others, others' situations and circumstances. She had no answer for. But now back to what I'd like to close with. We have the record here, the healing of Naaman. But does it strike you that we wouldn't have that in the Bible if a little girl hadn't remained true to God and maintained her integrity and borne her witness under circumstances that we know little or nothing about. If that little girl had gotten bitter, if she hadn't retained her integrity, if she hadn't testified, this whole business wouldn't be in the Bible. <clears throat> now, what I think happened, I think out of the simplicity of her faith, there's a prophet over in Samaria that would heal this man. Her faith reached through to God. God reached down and touched that prophet. And that prophet sent for that leper. There was a cycle of faith and divine power. A little girl believed God. God moved, touched a prophet, and he moved. And a leper was healed. But again, it all reaches back and ties to one little maid that was true under circumstances vastly different than yesterday in this camp. Oh, I enjoyed yesterday's services, but somewhere down the road, you may be faced with situations that aren't like yesterday. 
God will want you to stand true and bear witness when the conditions are vastly different than they were yesterday. May God help you to be what he wants you to be where you, wherever you are as he needs your witness. God bless his word.